everyone and welcome. I'm Michael Roberts, Executive Director of Public Programs here at Asia Society, and I want to welcome you all. It's a great pleasure to present uh, an important and authoritative new biography of one of the most compelling figures of the last 25 years. If the current embryonic transition in Myanmar succeeds in bringing that country back uh, from its quarter century of repression and stagnation and pariah status, a great deal of the credit will be owing to Aung San Suu Kyi. In 1988, as I'm sure you all know, she was propelled from the obscurity of uh, an English academic life to become the leader of Burma's democracy movement. And following her party's 1990 electoral victory and the subsequent mil military crackdown, she spent most of the next two decades in, under house arrest. Like uh, Mahatma Gandhi and Nelson Mandela before her, her oppressors only succeeded in making her an even more potent and important symbol of her country. And now that she's happily come out of confinement and will compete in the upcoming elections, the whole world is watching to see what the next chapter of this extraordinary story will be. Uh, this excellent book, The Lady and the Peacock, The Life of Aung San Suu Kyi, will remain an indispensable part of that story. Uh, it will be on sale afterwards uh, in back of the uh, hall, and I hope you'll all buy it, and uh, the author, Peter Popham, will be happy to sign it for you. We're happy to have him with us tonight. He writes frequently for the British newspaper, The Independent, and has reported from Albania, Mongolia, South Asia, and now Italy. He's also the author of Tokyo, The City at the End of the World. I'm happy to say that Asia Society has been able to make important contributions which continue to informing the policy dialogue in the United States and Asia and to helping directly through Track 2 and other initiatives to bring about a democratic transition in Myanmar. We're delighted to have the architect of those efforts and Asia Society's Vice President for Global Policy Programs, Suzanne DiMaggio, to conduct our conversation with Peter. Suzanne is co-author with Priscilla Clapp of the Asia Society Report, Advancing Myanmar's Transition, A Way Forward for U.S. Policy, which I think uh, you'll find copies of on your chair, and I urge you all to read it. It's a, it's a, uh, a really excellent and important piece of work. Suzanne and her team are also doing important things in relation to Iran, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, and other complex issue areas facing Asia and the world. This summer, they'll release a new report uh, led by our senior uh, Asia Society advisor, Hassan Abbas, to, who has uh, assessed the current state of Pakistan's police forces, and in a report that's uh, co-authored by uh, other Pakistani and U.S. experts, they will uh, present recommendations for enhancing institutional capacity within uh, Pakistani police forces. Also, please come back on April 12th for another exceptional program on the same subject, which is called the U.S., Pakistan, and Afghanistan Untangling Without Unraveling. This is part of our HBO-sponsored series on Asian hotspots and it will feature Dr. Vali Nasser, the newly named dean just yesterday of the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and a former advisor to Asia Society's late chair, Richard Holbrook. Vali Nasser will be speaking with Dr. Saeed Shafkat and Professor Christine Fair of Georgetown University. Please check out Asia Society's website for additional information on this and other programs. There are also flyers in back. Just a couple more housekeeping announcements. If you are not members of Asia Society already, I hope you'll consider joining. We present a great many wonderful programs here and performances and work in all the disciplines and media in which Asia Society works. And, uh, it's a uh, tremendous value for a very small amount of money, so we hope you'll consider joining. I want to remind you that we are live webcasting tonight's program, and I'm also very happy to say that we are, it's being uh, recorded for C-SPAN for later rebroadcast. So when we come to the question and answer, please be sure to wait for the microphone, and we may have questions from our online viewers. And if we do, any of you watching, feel free to write in to moderator at asiasociety.org. And of course, turn off your cell phones if you have them. And uh, welcome, please, Peter Popham and Suzanne DiMaggio. Peter, uh, sorry. 
Peter will read first, and then Suzanne will join him uh, on the dais for discussion. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good evening. Lovely to see so many people here today. Um, I've been um, thinking about Burma, visiting Burma for more than 20 years and um, have been writing this book for, I, I was in the process of researching and writing it for five or six years before it was actually finished. Uh, but certainly Burma has never been so interesting and important as it is at this particular moment. So I feel very fortunate to have found an American publisher with the, with the energy and gumption to get it out at exactly the right moment. Um, and to the Asia Society for having the kindness and, and uh, to, to welcome me to, to talk about it. I thought I'd read a few pages from my book about the election of 1990, because we're on the cusp, as you know, of a by-election on Sunday the 1st of April. Um, it is only the, the third such election since... Uh, 1990, multi-party election, um, 1990 election, then 2010, and then this by-election, which will be followed by another general election in 2015. So I, think it, I thought it would be worthwhile looking back um, 22 years to Aung San Suu Kyi's first um, appearance, not on the ballot papers because she was barred from standing, but the first appearance of her party um, and what transpired. On Sunday, May the 27th, 1990, Aung San Suu Kyi, still under detention in her home, cast her, ball cast her vote in her country's first free general elections for 30 years. The ballot paper was put into an envelope which was sealed and taken from her home by a regime official. To most foreign observers, it looked like a futile gesture. For weeks, the international media had been scrutinizing Burma's upcoming poll and concluding that it was bound to be rigged. The military junta had done everything in their power to ensure a good result, a win for the National Unity Party, the junta's tame proxy party, as the BSPP, the Burma Socialist Programme Party, had been hurriedly rebranded. The top leadership of Sue's party, the National League for Democracy, had been put out of action, with Aung San Suu Kyi under house arrest since July the 20th, 1989, I should say. U Tin U, the retired general who was chairman of the party, and who had been detained the same day, was sentenced to three years hard labor in December and taken to insane jail. Most of their closest colleagues had been jailed and would not re-emerge for years. The party was now run by a skeleton staff of those who remained at liberty, led by U Ji Maung, aged 72, the tubby, wisecracking former colonel who had been one of the first people to join Sue two summers before. In January, the regime sought to neutralize the threat posed by Sue's personal popularity by barring her from standing as a candidate because of her marriage to a foreigner, a new rule. Her image was everywhere in the NLD's campaign on banners, T-shirts, posters, badges and scarves Cassette tapes of her campaign speeches were sold from market stalls, but the lady herself was firmly locked away. General Kin Nyunt, head of military intelligence and the second most powerful man in the junta, in two long speeches drove home the message that Sue's party was a menace to the country's future. On August the 5th, he repeated the now familiar claim that the NLD had been infiltrated by communists. The following month, at a press conference where he spoke for seven hours, 
he made the diametrically opposite allegation that Sue and her party were at the heart of an international rightist conspiracy involving powerful foreign countries.